This is another iRaw podcast. A few years ago, I had a call from Brett Hume, who was a reporter for Fox News, and he said, I heard that you said that bees, trees, whales, and fish are more important than people. Did you say that? And I said, yes, I, I did. He says, how could you say something so outrageous as to say these things are more important than people? And I said, because they're more important than people for the very simple fact that they can survive without us. We cannot survive without them. Welcome back to the Animal Town Podcast. In this bonus episode, I'm speaking to Captain Paul Watson about his recent book, Hitman for the Kindness Club. And I decided to focus this episode on the concept of interference. And while we don't do a deep dive into what the concept of interference means, over the course of this interview, I think we touch on a variety of different ways in which to, I guess, interfere with animal exploitation or violence directed at animals. And sometimes that's through what Paul Watson calls as passive nonviolence or aggressive, sorry, aggressive nonviolence. I get it muddled up several times in the interview where I call it passive aggressiveness, but we speak a bit about that as a strategy for interfering. We also speak a little bit about the role that academics, scientists, and scholars can play in such interference. And throughout, I think the episode, we touch a little bit on both what activists can do to interfere, what scholars can do to interfere, as well as how I think animals interfere in some of these operations. But Overall, we just really have, I think, a good conversation about some of Paul Watson's life, some of the experiences he's had, and some of what he highlights in his book, Hitman for the Kindness Club. Before we get to the interview itself, perhaps I should tell you a little bit about him. So Captain Paul Watson is a marine wildlife conservation and environmental activist. He was one of the founding members and directors of Greenpeace, and in 1977, he left Greenpeace and founded the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society. He's a renowned speaker, accomplished author, master marina, and a lifelong environmentalist, and he's also been awarded many honors for his dedication to the oceans and to the planet. Among many of his commendations, he received the Genesis Award for Lifetime Achievement in 1998 and was named as one of the top 20 environmental heroes of the 20th century by Time magazine in 2000. He was also inducted into the U.S. Animal Rights Hall of Fame in Washington, D.C. in 2002 and awarded the Amazon Peace Prize by the President of Ecuador in 2007. So he is, to say the least, an extremely accomplished environmental activist. And you can find out more about the Captain Paul Watson Foundation at the thepaulwatsonfoundation.org. He's a really interesting guy. He speaks plainly and frankly, I think, about human interactions with animals. I will say, unfortunately, at about the 56-minute mark or 59-minute mark, we ran into some technical difficulties. Our connection just kind of kept dropping. We managed to squeeze in a quick story about a sperm whale who Watson encountered in 1975 that saved his life. But then unfortunately, the line dropped and we just couldn't get back together for Paul to tell us what he's currently working on. So if you want to learn more about what Paul is working on, as well as his book, I encourage you to go and check out the Paul Watson Foundation to find out more. He continues to do work fighting whaling and and all forms, I think, of exploitation directed against animals. So go check that out. And I hope you enjoy listening. Welcome to the Animal Turn Podcast. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. I just finished reading your book, Hitman for the Kindness Club, and I've got to admit that's an interesting that's an interesting title. <laughs> I was wondering what a, what a hitman and kindness club have in common, but it was a really interesting read. And you've had, I think, a life filled of incredible adventure and danger, and 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 incredible things that you've done for a variety of different animals. So I'm looking forward to talking to you a bit about the book today. But I am hoping that we can speak a little bit about this idea of interference. It seems to me that throughout your career, you've you've made a career of interfering, of, of getting in the way. And I think that it's something I'd like to talk to you about today. But before we get into that, could we maybe talk a little bit about you and your, your story? So what made you write Hitman for the Kindness Club and, and how, did you come to, how did you come to be this person that we now know as Paul Watson? Well, I thought the book was an opportunity to talk about things that I'm normally not known for, which is, you know, the other animals that I've in, been involved with over the years other than, um, you know, marine mammals. 
And the, the idea for the title actually came from the fact that when I was 10 years old, I was a member of a group called the Kindness Club. And that was a group that was founded by Ida Fleming. She was actually the wife of the the premier or the governor of New Brunswick at the time. Very conservative (laughs) government, actually. But she had set this thing up called the Kindness Club. Elver Schweitzer was the honorary president in that. And all it was was to to teach children to be kind to, to, to animals. And so many years later, and when I was in my mid-20s, in interfering with the Canadian seal hunt, I dropped by to see her and, you know, to visit with her. And she was happy to see me. And she she was the one who said, well, you've become the hitman for the Kindness Club. So that's where the the title came from. That's, yes, yeah, an incredible story. And some of what you've done for seals, through, throughout the book, you mention a whole host of animals. And as you say, I think you're most well known for your relationship with, with whales. But it seems that you've had a career of intervening on behalf of a range of animals, whether it be beavers or cod or gorillas you've 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 tended to take on animal and animal based project what what inspires you to do this why why are animals so important for you and why do you think intervening on their behalf is is so important well it actually all began when i was 10 years old and i spent the summer uh, swimming with a family of beavers uh, in new brunswick and that was a wonderful summer I, every day i was out there swimming with them particularly this one little beaver and the next summer when I went back, I was really quite excited to, you know, to, to see them again. And then they weren't there. And I began to ask around and found out that trappers had just taken them all during the winter time, And that made me very angry. So that winter, I began to walk the trap lines and find the traps, free any animals from the traps and destroy the traps. And I guess I've been doing the same thing for the last 60 years. Aren't you scared when you do these things? Like, I mean, so there's there's releasing... I guess when you're a kid, you don't necessarily know the the consequences and you're brave enough to release the, the traps. But throughout your career, you've been arrested, you've been put in jail, you've been threatened with guns by everyone from like Soviets to, to warships. You know, you've you've had incredible encounters. Like, aren't you aren't you scared when you're there and you're facing Present time. Uh, I, I don't recall ever being scared, and that you know, I guess in a way, I, you know, I've, it's it's an exciting <laughs> intervention, but also I find myself in a confrontation situation, of somewhat detached. That you know, you have to focus on the situation at hand, and you, you don't allow, allow yourself to get emotional. For instance, also, you, you know, I've seen animals being killed, uh, seal pups uh, being kicked in the face, skinned alive, and that. And, and you have to almost be like a surgeon in a way. You have to be somewhat detached because you can't let your emotions take over and you do something, you know, silly. You know, back in 1977, I, I set up this strategy, which I call uh, aggressive nonviolence. And that means to aggressively intervene, but to not cause any injury to the people that you're intervening against. And that's an unblemished record. We've never caused an injury to anybody, but we have intervened in hundreds and hundreds of situations that saved the lives of, you know, literally tens of thousands of animals. When you developed this idea of aggressive nonviolence, I get from from the book that this was in response to what you believe to be too passive an intervention into defending animals and fighting on their behalf. Could you tell us a little bit about your your backstory with, with Greenpeace? Well, I was a co-founder of Greenpeace, and the first voyage was in 1971 to protest nuclear testing up on Amchik Island, which is a wildlife preserve. And then in 1972, we formally turned the group we called the Don't Make a Wave Committee, we turned it into the Greenpeace Foundation. And I was the first officer on all the early Greenpeace voyages. Now, I got increasingly more frustrated because what I was seeing were, you know, seals being killed, whales being killed, and all we were doing was taking pictures or hanging banners and really weren't accomplishing anything uh, except for... The thing is that Greenpeace was actually formed by two groups, the Sierra Club, the environmental side of it, and the Quakers, which were the peace side of it. And the Quaker philosophy is bearing witness and not intervening. And that that really bothered me. I mean, you don't walk down the street, see a woman being raped and do nothing but take her picture. And you don't walk down the street, see a puppy or a kitten being kicked to death and hang a banner saying, please stop doing that. You know, you, I think at some point morally, you, you you have to intervene. But at the same time, you have to operate within the boundaries of the law and practicality 
and be as cautious as possible, but still be effective. So it's difficult, but it's the only way to really proceed. I'm happy you brought up the law there because it seems as though we we it seems as though you were often operating under international law or that you would have these kind of international policies that have been developed. I think one of them you mentioned is the UN World Charter for for Nature and that you would intervene using this as your kind of mechanism, I suppose, that you would intervene to do this because international law or at least agreements had said that this was the priority globally. But then you would be kind of conflicted or met with national laws. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about about that, how how you use law to to help you, but also how law has maybe hindered some of your your objectives? Well, laws are very complicated because, you know, you have local law, provincial or state law, national law, international law. So they come into conflict with, with each other. I mean, we have all the laws, treaties, regulations that we need to protect, say, life in the ocean. But there's no enforcement. There's a complete lack of enforcement. So what's the point of law without any enforcement? So when we go against illegal activities, we're being accused of being criminals or terrorists or whatever. But the fact is the activities we're opposing are illegal. In 1993, I chased the Cuban and Spanish drag trawlers off the coast of of Newfoundland, off the Grand Banks of Newfoundland. I was charged by the Canadian government with three counts of mischief for doing that. And we went to court and I was in court on, on trial in a province where everybody hated me because of my opposition to the seal hunt. So it didn't look too good, but I got the best lawyer I could find in Newfoundland. And he actually, the opening of the trial, he said to the jury, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I'm not going to say we didn't do this. I'm going to say we're proud. We, we did do it. And we're proud to do it. And we're going to do it again. That was our opening defense. But I use the UN World Charter for Nature, which states that any individual or non-government organization is empowered to uphold international conservation law. And Canada brought in a law professor to say, well, that doesn't mean anything under Canadian law. Canada doesn't recognize that. And the judge said, did Canada sign this at the UN? And she said, well, yeah, but Canada signs a lot of things. And he said to the jury, if Canada signed this, you're going to take this into account. So I was acquitted on those charges using the UN Charter for Nature as a defense. That's incredible. Yeah, because I think the a lot of intergovernmental organizations have been criticized for exactly what you're saying here, that they may be lack teeth. And it's not just, I think, organizations that deal with environmental concerns. It's organizations that deal with, you know, conflict, that deal with a whole host of, you, you know, it's it's... I, I think that it's great that we have international governmental organizations like the UN. I think it's good that we're having these conversations at that kind of international level and creating these policies. But yes, we do sometimes lack, I think, some of the, the policing mechanisms that are necessary. Do you, Have you seen a change in the kind of willingness to monitor and regulate you know, interventions into nature and harming of nature since you started uh, doing all of this? Have you seen a more willingness from the international community to intervene on behalf of marine wildlife or on, on animals? Well, we see a lot of, just as last year, we saw an ocean protection law, you know, a national tr- or an international treaty, but it, it means nothing because there's no enforcement. All looks really good on paper and you got these really thick reports and, you know, and everybody's saying, congratulating themselves for passing these this bill or these regulations or this treaty. And yet you go out there and the poachers are there. And in fact, we have these, you know, marine protection areas. That's where the poachers go because they know that, you know, that area is more has more fish than other places, for example. But without enforcement, it, it, it's completely it's completely meaningless. How would you like to see this enforcement happen? As someone who's been out there, who's done this kind of work, what do you think what do you think should should happen to make this enforcement more tangible? The United Nations has peacekeeping forces that intervene for peacekeeping purposes. The United States, for instance, goes out there and enforces drug laws in international waters. So the the means are there. It's just a lack of economic and political will to do anything about it. 40% of all the fish that's taken out of the ocean is being caught illegally, and there's no way to trace that. And so we really have to get serious about protecting marine life, and, and there's simply just no political or economic will to do so. Can you paint us a picture of what's happening in the oceans? Why, 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 sh- why is this important? Why should intergovernmental bodies and organizations and animal studies scholars such as myself be paying attention to the oceans? 
Well, to be blunt about it, the oceans are dying. As the ocean dies, we die. You know, since 1950, there's been a 40% diminishment in phytoplankton populations in the sea. Phytoplankton, uh, these aquatic plants, provide up to 70% of the oxygen in the air that we breathe, and they sequester enormous amounts of CO2. And why is phytoplankton being diminished? It's because we've diminished populations of whales and dolphins and fish and seabirds. These are the species that provide the nutrients for phytoplankton, the magnesium, the nitrogen, and the iron. It comes from the feces of these animals and from, of course, their bodies after birth and everything that, uh, you know, that is set aside. But every day, one blue whale dumps three tons of manure into the ocean, which floats on the surface and provides the the, the nutrients for the phytoplankton. And most people aren't even aware of this. They think that trees are providing all the oxygen when, in fact, the forests of the world provide about 30%. But it's the, it's the ocean that sustains this. The ocean is was this, this incredible life support system that provides everything that we need. At the climate change conference in Paris in 2015, I said the solution to climate change, the best solution is to do nothing. And by I mean that, what I mean by that, leave the oceans alone, don't touch it. And we need to ban all these highly industrialized, mechanized fishing operations, which are just strip mining life from the, from the sea. And the ocean can respond, but it's going to take time, but we're not giving it, we're not giving it that, that, that time. If you look at the, at the planet as a, as a spaceship, which is what it is. We're on this incredible voyage around the Milky Way. And every spaceship has a life support system that provides us with the air we breathe and provides food, regulates climate and temperature. And that life support system is run and maintained by a, a crew of engineers that keep it all going. And we humans, we're not engineers. We're passengers. We're having a wonderful time amusing ourselves, but we're not engineers. But what we are doing is we're killing the engineers. We're killing them off. And there's only so many engineers that you can kill before the machinery begins to fall apart and break down. And a world without worms and bees and trees and fish is not a world that we can survive in. You know, a few years ago, I had a call from Brett Hume as a reporter for Fox News. And he said, I heard that you said that Bees, trees, whales, and fish are more important than people. Did you say that? And I said, yes, I, I did. He says, how could you say something so outrageous as to say these things are more important than people? And I said, because they're more important than people for the very simple fact that they can survive without us. We cannot survive without, without them. We don't live in a world without bees. We don't live in a world without worms and insects. We don't live in a world without, without fish and trees. I mean, that's the reality of it. And the problem is for thousands of years that we've, we've built up this anthropocentric point of view. It's all about us. Everything is created about just for us. And, and we're in the center of everything. Every major religion on this planet holds human beings as the center of everything. Even though we've only been on this planet for a very, very small fraction of time, but somehow or other, we've convinced ourselves that it's all made just for us, and we can do anything we want with it. And that, well, that's one of the reasons I actually set up my own church, which is called the Church of Biocentrism, to try and further the idea that we're part of everything, we're not you know, dominant over everything, and that everything is interdependent. And there's three basic laws of ecology. One is the first, uh, the law of diversity, that the strength of an ecosystem lies in diversity. The second is the law of interdependence, that all species within an ecosystem are interdependent with each other. And the third is the law of finite resources, that there's a limit to growth and a limit to carrying capacity. And when one species, like our own, steals the carrying capacity from other species, it leads to the diminishment of both diversity and interdependence, which leads to ecological collapse. You know, it's interesting when thinking about ecocentrism because I so often, you know, I consider myself to be like an animal centric person, which I know, I know, of course, animals are part of ecosystems that animals such as ourselves rely on a variety of different plants and relations with other animals in order to survive. So this is not to disavow. I think that ecology matters. I think that would be daft to do so. But I think that when I approach things, I approach things as animal centric, not ecocentric. And the reason being is I sometimes worry that in the step of being ecocentric, a lot of conservationists, et cetera, will speak about sustainable development. They'll speak about maintaining an environment, but they'll forget that there are actual individuals and animals that experience these interventions. So I think this is sometimes why conservationists can get away or have a strategy saying that in order to maintain biodiversity, we need to kill 
a whole herd of, of elephants or in order to maintain biodiversity, we need to kill this one giraffe in a zoo. And I think that sometimes an ecocentric, and not always, but sometimes an ecocentric model can forget that and use killing to somehow maintain, I don't know, maintain an idea of some sort of ideal nature, an ideal ecology, which is not where we're at anymore. Well, ecocentrism, that's just another form of anthropocentrism, is humans deciding that they know the answers to everything. That's why what I promote is biocentrism. The fact that all species are equal and actually some are more equal than us, but that, you know, we all have to live in harmony. All species have to live in harmony. And in a natural world, that's exactly what happens. But we've intervened with that drastically and have caused the diminishment of populations of pretty much all everything. And so, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying about that. There's this idea that, you know, that there are answers and we can, we're the people who can find those answers and we're the people who can implement the solutions. But my position on this is that, no, the, the solutions will come from the laws of ecology, diversity, interdependence, that, you know, it's, it's outside of our control, really. Yeah, I think I, I was just trying to point to the fact that animals experience our interventions, that, they, that they're not just like these things that are part of ecology. They are, we are beings that experience these ecological interventions. To most animals, we're simply Nazis. <laughs> you know, we're out of control. We have no, uh, you know, empathy for the fact that they're living, sentient, self-aware beings. And it's a complete lack of compassion on ourselves as a, as a species. Yeah, we've inflicted, I think, incredible violence on a whole range of, of animals, whether they're wild animals or domesticated animals, the animals we, we breed in farms or the ones that we kill out in the oceans, or the ones where we have farmed fish, right? that sit in oceans that are, are creating a whole bunch of, of other problems. But I'm curious then, you know, why you must experience when you're out in the ocean on one of these ships, you must experience the curiosity of other animals about humans, that, that dolphins and whales, and you don't speak about this in, in the book, but that they, they approach, surely do they approach your ship? Do they want to interact? Do they show a willingness to interact with humans, despite the violence that we've inflicted on them? Well, I found many experiences where, you know, whales have come up, come up to me, seals have come up to me. <laughs> Actually, one idea that I had was to create a, a cruelty-free, non-lethal form of sealing. That is to get the sealers to put down the clubs and pick up hairbrushes, because uh, baby seals, uh, those white coats, they molt that hair after two weeks. And it's not really white fur. It's, it's a transparent, each hair follicle is transparent and therefore it retains heat, somewhat like polar bear hair. And every seal pup yields about 200 grams of hair. And I went out experimentally and took a hairbrush and began to brush them. And it comes off. You just brush it off. And they enjoy it. They actually turn over and let you do their belly, whatever, everything like this. And that was, it was a great idea. I got a permit for it. I, got, I even got a market in Germany for this, you know, to buy this. And uh, I was going to employ these sealers. But then we got attacked by all these drunken sealers who... Uh, who uh, can, you know, said, you know, uh, seals are meant to be clubbed. They're not meant to be coddled. You know, you're a bunch of faggots, blah, 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 and everything like that. And, and you know, I, I got assaulted. A few, the reporters got assaulted and everything. And then the government's response was, no, you can't have the permit. It's, uh, you know, if the, the fishermen don't like it. The problem is, is fishermen tend to get whatever they want. I, I actually coined a word called homofeshophobia, which is politicians fear of fishermen. Whatever the fishermen want, they get. And that's one of the problems. So, you know, fishermen, the fishing industry has the capability of destroying life on this planet and they can collapse civilization. It's one of the most insidious, destructive industries on the planet. And, you know, I just see them out there every day. There's like millions of fishing boats out there just doing incredible destruction. It's a really good book, which was written by a former fisherman from Newfoundland called Sea of Heartbreak where he goes out on a voyage and they shoot everything. If they see a bear on the shore, they shoot it. If they catch or catch birds, they tie them together and make them pe peck each other to death. They just, it, it, they're just walking murder machines. That's all these fishermen are, really. And now, for instance, we're going to go out in a couple months to confront the super tankers, the super trawlers. And these 
for instance, this one vessel that we're targeting, the Margrius, it's like 6,000 tons, 150 meters. It pulls in 7,000 tons of fish on every voyage. And every time it pulls in its net, it's about three school buses full of fish. It just pulls them in, pulls them in. Last year, we documented this this particular trawler dumping 100,000 blue whiting fish because, well, it wasn't their target. That's not though. It wasn't economically viable to keep them. So they just threw them overboard. For every kilo of, of anything that's caught, there's you know, dozens of kilos of things that are thrown away. Shrimp, for example, every kilo of shrimp yields about 22 kilos of everything else, including sea turtles and whatever. It's a, an incredibly destructive industry. And here's the problem with it is that, you know, you go to the fish markets full of fish. Where are they coming from if there's so much diminishment? I get that all the time. Well, obviously, there's a lot of fish. Well, the problem is, is to get those fish, you have to invest in incredible technologies to find that diminished number of fish. You've got $200 million ships out there, which means that they're in debt to the banks for incredible amounts of money, which means they have to keep catching fish in order to pay off those loans. They're using satellites to find the fish. They're using fish aggregating devices. The fish have nowhere to, to go. In fact, Rayathon, which produces a fish finding device, their actual motto is the fish can run, but they can't hide. And that's the problem. They can't hide. And we're seeing every, there is no sustainable fishing anywhere on the planet today. Every single commercial fishery is in a state of collapse. And they don't want to listen to it because the scientists who work for the governments, I have a word for them. I call them biostitutes. They basically, you know, here, here's your, here, they want the answers. We're going to pay you to give us the correct answers. And for instance, during the 80s, I warned repeatedly during the 80s that the northern cod populations were going to collapse. And the government would come back and say, we have the best scientists in the world. We have computer models. You don't know what you're talking about. Who the hell are you? You know, the, the, it's not going to happen. 92, it did. It collapsed. The government says, that's okay. And we'll have a five-year moratorium. It'll come back. No, it didn't. It's never re recovered. It's, and it never will. Because they don't understand the, the ecology of the ocean. The fact that the northern cod, the young cod depend on the older cod in order to, you know, to do whatever they, the cod do. And when you, when you wipe out all the older generation, you got a bunch of young cod going, wandering around the ocean, not really knowing where to go or what to do. And so it's never really recovered. You know, uh, again, I was uh, debating the fisheries scientists one time, and I said, you know, the coho and Chinook populations are going to collapse out of the Fraser River population. And he said, you don't know what you're talking about. You are wrong. I said, look, it's going to collapse in three years. And he said, you don't know what you're talking about. Well, I was wrong. It took a year, not three years. These, these, these so-called scientists, they, they're there to say what the governments want them to say. And so they're, they're, not, they're not there to find a solution. It's called, I call it the economics of extinction. There is money to be made by driving species into extinction. Like, for instance, bluefin tuna the most valuable fish on the planet. One bluefin tuna can sell for $75,000 in the Japanese market. And we've wiped out 90% of them, but they're still fishing them. Now, there's enough bluefin tuna in the warehouses of Mitsubishi alone, just that one company, to supply their customers for the next 10 to 15 years. And so they, they could actually say, okay, we're not going to kill any bluefin tuna for the next 10 to 15 years because we have these tuna in the warehouses. Why won't they do that? Because if, they, if the bluefin tuna populations begin to rise in the sea, the value of the commodity in the warehouses goes down. Scarcity translates into higher prices and therefore into, into profits. You need to keep these species scarce. I was raised in a fishing village in eastern Canada. And, you know, when I look at what fish were selling then and what they're fishing now, it's incredible the prices that are being paid and people are paying them. I mean, lobsters were so cheap when I was a kid that we went to school and you could tell the poor kids in our school because we were the ones who went to school with lobster sandwiches on homemade bread, desperately trying to trade it for bologna on Wonder Bread or something, which we thought was exotic. So, you know, lobsters used to be called the poor man's meat, but now when they get more scarce, they become more valuable. You know, fish have come up a couple of times in the podcast as as animals that we tend to neglect. And I remember reading Jonathan Balcom's book, 
what a fish knows. And reading, I think his opening lines are that there are more species of fish than there are mammals, amphibians, and reptiles combined. So you start to think about the complexity and the beauty and the 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 just the amazing diversity there must be of fish and what we don't know. But why do you think we struggle? Do you think that this is a problem of not being able to empathize with marine life or marine animals? Or is this a challenge that scientists and humans in general have with being able to empathize with animals generally? Well, I think it's both. But also when it comes to fish, most people just look at fish as vegetables, really. That's the way they, you know, they don't perceive them as having any intelligence or any feelings or any any emotions. And we also lump them all together, fish. You take a salmon, which takes four years to become sexually mature and then dies. Then you take an orange roughy, which takes 45 years to become sexually mature and lives to be 200 years of age. The orange roughy population crashed in the 90s because we were overfishing it because there was too much demand and they just couldn't keep up with that demand because of the reproduction was so so slow. But we just treat all of these fish as fish. <laughs> we don't look at all the various species and how they're they're completely different from each other. Their behavior is different and that. And then what we've done is we've now adapted to diminishment so that as we wipe out one species, we just move on to another. When I was a child, for instance, nobody ate mussels in Eastern Canada. They're considered dirty. But now that's where you get when you go to a restaurant in my hometown because we took out the scallops and the, and the oysters and that. But the pollock, for example, was an animal, a uh, fish that had no taste. Nobody was interested in it. But then they discovered that, well, if we take the white flesh of the pollock and we put a, a chemical smell to it and put a strip of red dye along it, we can sell it as artificial crab and call it surami, or, you know, for the Japanese word. So then we began to wipe out the pollock. The same is true with, with other fishes, which, you know, for instance, turbot. Turbot was considered a trash fish. It's not a very nice thing to say about a fish, but that's what the industry called it, a trash fish. Nobody wanted it. But now that's the fish you get in a restaurant in New York City or Paris because we wiped out all the other more expensive fish. And it all comes down to marketing. For instance, the spider crab. Nobody was interested in eating the spider crab because, well, it's a spider. It looks like a spider's got the name. So let's just change the name to Alaska king crab. And then everybody begins to buy it. The same with a Chilean sea bass. It's not from Chile. It's not a bass. It's a Patagonia or Antarctic toothfish. Rather ugly looking fish uh, in most people's eyes, but the let's just call that Chilean sea bass and sell it as a, as that product. So it's all about marketing. It, it sometimes it, work, it doesn't work. Like for instance, the giant clams that you find off the Pacific Northwest, gooey gooey ducks, they call them. They decided to call that the 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 queen clam, but it never really caught on. But this is the kind of thing that they're trying, trying to do. I, I got to say, I really, really like your idea and your concept of economics of extinction. I think it shows how, how you know, the laws we were speaking about earlier and the variety of like state interventions are often in service of economics, not necessarily in service of life or ecology. But what you just said there about marketing, I find fascinating because I know that you use marketing quite a bit in your your interventions, that that you find media a really useful strategy for intervening on behalf of environments and on behalf of animals. Can you tell me a little bit about your your kind of philosophy when it comes to, to media? Well, we live in a media culture and media defines reality. I mean, everything you eat, everything you wear, all your behavior is, is molded by the media uh, around us. We're not as free as we think we are. And so I think it's important to understand how media works. And to get your message across, you have to give them a story because there's only four elements of media. That's sex, scandal, violence, and celebrity. Every story has one or more of those elements. And if it doesn't, it's not simply not a story. So we've had to use over the years how to use celebrities to get our point across. I learned that very well in 1977 when I took Bridget Bardot out to the ice floes in Newfoundland and posing her cheek to cheek with a baby seal gave us a front cover of every major magazine on, on the planet. And so we, we use celebrities a lot. And also we tend to give the illusion of, you know, we're doing something very dramatically and almost violent, although it isn't violent. I guess the best example of this is back in 1984, I led a campaign to protect wolves in British Columbia. 
in the Yukon. And it had the all four elements. So it was a super story for, for like four years. Uh, I mean, excuse me, it was a super story for about uh, four days right across Canada. And the reason being is that we had all four elements. We had the violence of them shooting wolves from helicopters, the violence of them shooting at us. We had um, an environment minister who was taking a bribe from big game hunters. So we had the scandal and the violence argument down. So what I did was recruited Bo Derrick as our spokesperson for that campaign. And at the press conference, you know, the place was full of cameras and everything. And the reporter for the Vancouver Sun said, come on, what's Bo Derrick know about wolves? This is stupid having her as your spokesperson. And I said, well, if I had Dr. Gordon Haver or Dr. David Meck here, the two most foremost wolf biologists in the world, this would be an empty room and you wouldn't be interested. The fact that she's a spokesperson means the place is full. And it'll be the front page story of your newspaper tomorrow. You'll write it. Your editor will give it a headline and that's where it's going to be. And that's exactly what it was. You know, they can't, you have to control those elements in order to get your story across. But the media has also had, I think, things to, to say a bit about you. You've Sometimes you've been framed as an eco-terrorist. You've had governments call you this. You've had the media call you this. You've maybe had some challenges with the previous organizations that you were part of, including Greenpeace and Sea Shepherd. Has, has, have some of these elements worked against you over the course of your career? Would you do anything differently? No, I don't think so because... You know, I, I did the Bill Maher show and he said, well, you know, people are calling you an eco-terrorist. I said, look, I've never worked for Monsanto. Let's just get, you know, get the facts right. Nobody's ever been killed by an environmentalist. Nobody's ever been killed by an animal rights person. It's never happened. So, you know, they're, of course, they're going to manipulate this and try and use this against you. But, you know, this is one of the reasons for using nonviolence. It's pretty hard to get around it. You know, as even Mahatma Gandhi said, if it was a choice between cowardice and violence, I would choose the violent path because I cannot abide cowardice. And I've never been a passive anything. But Gandhi knew that nonviolence worked against the British who felt themselves morally superior to everybody else. It would never, and he said, it would never have worked against the Nazis. It would never have worked against the Stalinists. Gandhi in Germany or then in the 30s or in Russia would have been put up against a wall and shot. It worked because he understood the, his opposition. And that's what we always have to do is understand our opposition. We look for their, 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 their weak points. And in the case of Gandhi, it was the fact that he, the, the British felt, well, you know, we're, we're more morally better than everybody else. So he used that. And I think it also, it also helped that you've always had kind of cameras and media with you on many of these exhibitions. You worked as a journalist yourself for a little bit of time. And I think you, you, I don't know, it seemed to me that you really appreciate that having media with you helps to kind of level the playing field a bit when you've got entire governments that are that are pitted against you. Maybe you could paint a picture for us about some of what this looked like in the, the east coast of Canada. So you spent a lot of time in the east coast of Canada fighting for seals, and you've had a bit of a conflicting relationship with the Canadian government. Maybe you could tell us a story about something that happened there. Well, yeah, it was a long fight with the Canadian government. I've been fighting uh, the seal hunt off and well, it was from 1975 up until 2008. And that's in 2008 is when we managed to get rid of the, the market for, for seal products from Canada. And that, that you know, the, the, it took a long time. None of these things happen overnight. You know, you have to really put a lot of effort into it. But with the Canadian government, it was, you know, we were fighting the sealers on the ice, but also fighting the Canadian government in court, fighting them in the media. and. So again, you have to manipulate the the situation to get as much coverage as possible. And sometimes you have to say things which are shocking or, you know, you got to rock the boat. You got to really piss people off and or in order to get your message across. For instance, uh, four sealers died in 2008 because they were being towed by a Canadian Coast Guard vessel, which weren't paying attention. They overturned uh, the boat and the, the sealers died in the ice. Well, the next day, of course, they come to me and ask me, well, what, what, what I think about the fact that these four sealers died. And I said, well, they died because of the incompetence of the Canadian government. And I said, and they said, well, don't you think this is an incredible tragedy? I said, yes, it's a tragedy. But it's not as big as a tragedy of killing 400,000 seals every year. Oh, they, they just went ballistic when I said that. And so a couple of days later, I was doing a CBC Live interview. And they said, are you ready to apologize to the people of the Magdalene Islands for your insensitive comments about how, you know, 400,000 seals were worth more than the lives of four sealers? I said, yeah, I'm ready to apologize. And so they turned the camera on and said, 
I'd like to apologize for being a Canadian and being associated with this massacre of 400,000 seals, you know, so, you know, you use every opportunity you can. And again, the reason that they, I was being insensitive is from an anthropocentric point of view that says that four, four human lives are more important than 400,000 seals, which is just simply not the case. 400, the, the survival of a species is much more important than the survival of, a, of an individual. You know, when I was teaching at UC, uh, when I was teaching at UCLA, I used to give my students this, this this dilemma. Okay, you got a choice between saving a Rembrandt or a species of bird. Which one would you choose? And they would you know, a lot of them. They were art students. Well, a Rembrandt. I said, yeah, it'll be gone in a couple hundred years. It'll be away, but the bird will still, you know, species will survive. But then I gave them another one. Here's your choice: survey one human baby, a human baby, its life, or you know, we, we lose this unknown species of bacterium. And they said, does the bacterium survive and the baby die or does the baby live and we get rid of the bacterium? And of course, they'll all say, well, the life of the baby is more important than a bunch of bacteria. I said, thanks, you just destroyed the human species because the unknown species of bacterium are the ones that keep you alive, the bacterium in your gut, you know, because we think that we're, we think that we're individuals, but we're not. We're actually, uh, we're actually a collection of things about 40 percent of our body isn't even us you know it, it, it's bacterium it's viruses and everything it keeps everything producing vitamins digesting our food and everything and so we forget that we're completely interdependent with all of these microscopic animals and that we're not even aware of their of their existence but if we were to wipe them out we'll die along with them and that's pretty much true of everything else if we wipe out the big bees we're going to die too I think what you say is, is true and fair. I think the idea that we always put human life above every other kind of life is nonsensical. But I also think that so often, and like you've painted here, so often we have to also think about the, I don't want to get into a utilitarian kind of idea where one life equals one life plus minus, because I think that that maybe neglects the kind of relationships we have, right? So my question would be, what, well, who's the baby in relation to me? Or who are those seal, uh, those sealers in relation to me? But would that excuse, and I know I'm, I'm going into a different kind of argument here based on your response to the media, but I, I just think that it's a really, I don't think that we should be necessarily saying that all human life is more important than any other animal life. No, I think, again, I'm 100% I'm with you there. But I sometimes think that we get into these simple arguments of, and often like philosophical ideas or, or thought experiments, which are useful. But I think it's just often so much more complicated because I do wonder, you know, those, those sealers, I don't know, what is the, the life what is the life of a sealer like? You would know better than me. What, like, are they well paid, you know, or, or should we be pointing our fingers more at the industries that employ them, right? It's... To draw a comparison, you think about the slaughterhouses and factory farms. I am vegan. I don't eat meat. I think that there are terrible places. But I can't help but look at the slaughterhouse workers and think that they themselves are also kind of victims of a really much bigger system that's designed to oppress both people and animals. Is the same true for, for sealers? Well, you're more compassionate than me because, I, quite frankly, I don't really care about slaughterhouse workers, you know, but that's just me. The, the Canadian sealers are different, though. First of all, it's a glorified welfare pro project. The, the seal hunt makes no money for anybody. It exists because the Canadian government pumps $20 million in subsidies into it every year. By the way, the fishing industry only exists because of 76 to a $90 million, billion of subsidies which are put in into the year. Fishing could not exist without those government subsidies, so the government's backing it up. The U European Union is responsible for subsidizing vast fleets of fishing boats that go out there. If left to themselves in a purely market sort of capitalist system, the entire industry would collapse because it, it, just, uh, it, it just isn't profitable. So, you know, I would think that the sealers would be probably better off just to pay them to not kill seals. But what's the sealers' response to that? We're not going to take welfare. Well, you're already taking welfare, but you just don't want to take it in, the, in, in this way. You want to go out there and pretend that it's not welfare. What's happened with the seal hunt, by the way, is that the quota is still 400,000 seals, but they don't kill it because we destroyed the market. So they kill about 40,000 still every year. 
because of the subsidies. And those, and those seal pelts end up in warehouses in Newfoundland that just sit there because the Canadian government's gambling that they might be able to find another market. The only market they've been able to find is the selling of seal penises to China or some sort of voodoo, weirdo sort of uh, cure for impotence or something. And, but that's the only market they seem to have been able to, to come up with. So the economics of extinction seems to be state-sponsored, or at least state-supported, state, state supported to, to follow through with your concept there. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's these massive subsidies. And when it comes to the factory farms, I mean, this is, factory farms are one of the most insidious things on the planet because, first of all, a good 35% of all the fish that are caught are fed to farmed animals, whether they be farmed salmon or chickens or, or pigs. Chickens eat more fish than all the albatrosses and puffins in the world put together. And these factory farms exist because every year we have to kill millions of animals, euthanize them, because factory farms are a vector for the trans zoonomic transmission of viruses. And every time these viruses break out, they have to act, they have to destroy millions of animals. They killed 17 million mink in Denmark during the COVID outbreak, and that because they found out that the mink could get COVID. And so, I think one of the the emergence of diseases is a lot of it is coming out of factory farms. You know, in 1995, Laurie Garrett wrote a book called The Coming Plague, which was incredibly interesting because she predicted all of this stuff. You know, back in the 80s and 70s, we never heard of things like Ebola and the Zika bass and West Nile and, and Hanta and all of these these things. These are all new things. And, the, and it's coming out of this fact that we're destroying the environment and we're creating the situation for the zoonomic transmission of viruses from other species. You know, every... Every plant and every animal has viruses associated with it. And for the most part, in a natural world, those viruses are very beneficial. We need them. But when you destroy an ecosystem or a species and you reduce the number of that species, the viruses associated with that species have to go somewhere. And humans are pretty attractive. Eight billion of us, that's a pretty attractive host. Now, the virus, you know, it doesn't have a mind or anything like that, you know, but the virus doesn't want to kill the host because it needs a host to survive. But if there's a period of coexistence where the, the virus has to, you know, host die while it's trying to do this co coexistence until we adapt to it. That's why, for instance, native people died from these tra transmission of, of uh, bacteria and viruses from Europe because they had no resistance to it because it never got built up. But in Europe, People live side by side with cows. They live side by side with, with horses. The common cold comes from horses. You know, smallpox comes from cows and that. But we, by living side by side, we built up a resistance to it and everything. But people who were not exposed to it didn't have that. And so this exploitation of animals, I think, is one of the main causes for zoonomic transmission of viruses. And that's one of the things that we're dealing with up in the Pacific Northwest with the salmon farms transmitting viruses to indigenous salmon populations. So the Pacific salmon are dying off and being diminished because of the introduction of an exotic predator, the Atlantic salmon, into an ecosystem it doesn't belong. If you or I were to take a couple of piranhas and stick them in a lake in, say, Minnesota, we would be charged with a crime. So how do they get to put an Atlantic predator, an exotic species, into an environment it shouldn't be in? And the reason for that is billions of dollars in profits. And scientists will back them up on it. So you mentioned scientists earlier as well, and I think that this is a really important point to talk about, is how science is co-opted by industries and by governments. And you often, like, you'll see this in a journal article, for example, that'll say, you know, this study was sponsored by, you know, Monsanto or by the egg industry or whoever it is. For those of us who are doing science or research who are in animal studies more broadly, what would be the best way for us to intervene? Not all of us have a big ship. Not all of us are, that's not necessarily where our skill set is. But we believe that there needs to be more fight on behalf of animals. And as scholars, we want to contribute to that fight. What would be our best way of intervening? Well, you know, the strength of an ecosystem is in diversity. Therefore, the strength of any movement, any human movement, has to be in diversity. And that can be, the approach can be educational or litigational or legislation or direct intervention. It really depends on what people's passions are, what their abilities and what their skills are. So whether you're a lawyer or a teacher or, you know, it doesn't really matter as long as you use your abilities to make the world a better place. And 
also with the understanding that each and every one of us has the ability to actually change the world, to make a difference. I mean, look what Greta Thunberg has been able to do. Because of Diane Fossey, we still have mountain gorillas in Rwanda. Because of David Wingate, we still have storm petrels in Bermuda. Individuals can make an incredible difference to save an entire species or to save an ecosystem. And so there are many, many approaches, but it really depends on people's personal passions. And I've always said that the three virtues that can save the planet are imagination, courage, and passion. And when you combine those, I think you, you create a powerful force that can actually change things. And do you think we all need to be passive aggressive in order to do that? Mm, I'm not sure what you mean by being passive aggressive on that. I think that's your, so your idea of, I think you mentioned passive aggressive earlier, that idea of, and sorry if I've gotten the, the concept wrong, that idea of sometimes you can't just talk, sometimes you have to do. So how do we as scholars do instead of just talk, I suppose? By speaking out, most uh, probably is a, is the best way. You know, saying things that you know people don't really want to hear, and you know, and also using your credibility as a scholar in order to emphasize the importance of of, of what you're saying, because people will listen to people with, who have educational degrees where otherwise they might not. Unless, of course, you're an actor, then it doesn't matter what your degree is; they're going to listen to you, <laughs> or a musician. I sometimes jokingly say when people say to me, well, what should I study? Should I study oceanography or, or um, you know, marine biology? And I said, well, if you really want to make a difference, study music or drama, you'll probably have more of a say in the world <laughs> because that's the culture that we live in. You're killing me here. <laughs> well, that, I wanted to go into drama school when I was 18 and I was like, there's no money in drama, so I'll go to university instead. And now look, oh man, I took the wrong path, Paul. <laughs> But that, that, is a, that is the reality of it. But that doesn't mean that you don't have, you know, you, you can't express yourself. It doesn't mean that you can't make it, you make a difference. You just have to find a way to do it, I suppose. And, you know, I, I, and that's where the imagination part of it comes in. You know, use your imagination to try and find tactics and strategies that, 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 that are going to make a difference. When you heard that we would be talking about intervention or interference today, was there something in particular you hoped to say about interference as, as, a, as a concept, as an action that you wanted listeners to hear? Well, ba intervention, I mean, it's a very simple sort of thing. If you see anything, a person or a, an animal being tortured, abused, or, you know, about to be killed, then you intervene, you know, to stop that. Aggressive nonviolence, I guess the best way to explain. That's what I wanted to say earlier. Aggressive nonviolence, not passive aggressive. Sorry, aggressive nonviolence was what I was trying to remember. Yeah, uh, aggressive nonviolence. For instance, if a man is about to shoot an elephant and you will knock that rifle out of his hand and break that rifle, that's an act of nonviolence. You've just saved a life by destroying a non sentient object. You cannot commit an act of violence against a non sentient object. Violence can only be committed against a living, sentient thing or being. And so, the, the, you know, that's what really the essence of aggressive nonviolence is, is to aggressively intervene, but do it without causing any injury. You know, in, in 2010, I was invited to give a lecture to the FBI in Quantico. I mean, they actually paid me to come give a talk to them about, you know, the state of the environment or interventions. You know what we do. And at the one of the agents said, well, you know, Sea Shepherd's walking a pretty fine line when it comes to the law. And I said, well, does it really matter how fine that line is as long as you don't actually cross the line? I've never been convicted of a felony in my entire, in my entire life. So that's what I meant by that. So the oh, the, then they also said to me, well, you know, some of your crew have gone on to become eco-terrorists. And I said, like who? He said, well, Rod Coronado. I said, Rod Coronado freed some mink from a mink farm. Is that your definition of eco-terrorism? And they said, well, it's a crime. I said, well, from, well, aside from that, he did that five years after he left my, my crew. So, you know, I'm not responsible for that. He said, well, you trained them. You're responsible. I said, well, <laughs> I got some names for you. Timothy McVeigh, Lee Harvey Oswell, or Osama Bin Laden. You trained them. <laughs> so you're responsible. Mm, yeah. Okay. That's, that's really... It's, it's been really wonderful talking to you. And actually, I want to hear more about the ocean, really. Like, it's very rare that I have people on the show that have experienced the ocean and experienced what it feels like to be in the middle of the ocean. But I'll leave that for the last second. Let's turn to your quote first. Do you have a quote ready for us? 
A quote, well, the, the quote that I'm most famous for is, if the oceans die, we die. So tell us about the oceans then. Tell us about, like, the beauty of them, not just that they're dying and they're in distress. What is, what is amazing about the ocean? This is the planet ocean. This, this is not the earth. This is the planet ocean. And what does that mean? It means water, water in perpetual and continuous circulation. And sometimes it's in the sea, sometimes it's underground, sometimes it's locked in ice, sometimes it's in the clouds, and sometimes it's in the cells of every plant and animal on the planet. That means that we are the ocean. It's the ocean moving through us. It's interconnected with everything else. The, the ocean and the atmosphere is connected to the sea, connected to, to the water underground, connected to the ice locked up in the glaciers. This is one gigantic movement of, of the element wa- of water. And that's what composes most of our body is, is, is water. So that's what I like people to, to understand is that everything you look at, everything you experience is the ocean. That's beautiful. Especially when we feel like we're landlocked and we're far away from the ocean. The ocean still shapes our lives. We're still part of the ocean in this global ecosystem. Before I ask what you're working on now, could you tell me about the, the sperm whale in 1975 that changed that changed your, your life for you? Yeah, in, 19, in 1975, uh, we came up with this idea to protect the whales by, we were reading a lot of Gandhi at the time, and we thought that all we had to do was put our bodies between the harpoons and the whales, and that would protect them. And so in June of 75, Robert Hunter and I were in a small little boat in front of a Soviet harpoon vessel that was chasing eight sperm whales. And Every time the harpooner tried to take an aim, I would maneuver the boat to block his path. And this worked for about 20 minutes until, you know, the captain came running down the catwalk and screamed into the ear of the harpooner and then looked down at us and smiled and brought his finger across his throat. And that's when we realized that, uh, you know, Gandhi wasn't going to work for us that day. And uh, a few moments later, there was this uh, incredible explosion and the harpoon flew over our head and slammed into the backside of a female in a pod. And she, she rolled on her side. There was blood everywhere. And suddenly the largest whale in the pod rose up and slammed the water with his tail and dove. And he swam right underneath of us and threw himself up at the bow of the, of the Soviet vessel. And the harpooner was ready with an un, unattached harpoon, pulled the trigger and hit the whale point blank in the, in the head. And he fell back rolling in the water in agony. I mean, you can't kill a whale humanely. It's, you know, it takes a long time. And as he was thrashing about in the water and there's blood everywhere, I caught his eye. And suddenly he dove and he came. I saw a trail of bloody bubbles coming straight towards us real fast. And he came up and out of the water at an angle so that the next move was to come down on us and to crash down on us. And and suddenly, you know, as his his eye was right there, so close, I could see my own reflection in his eye. And then I saw something which was like a glimpse of understanding that the whale understood what we tried to do because I could see at the same time the effort he made to pull himself back to avoid coming down on top of us. And I saw his body begin to sink back into the sea as I disappeared beneath the surface and he died and he could have killed us. So I owe my life to that whale. But I also saw something else in that eye and that was pity and not for himself, but for us that we could take life so thoughtlessly. And I said to myself, why are we killing these whales? They don't eat them. They kill sperm whales for oil, for a high heat resistant lubricating oil. And one of the things that it was most prized with was for the production and maintenance of intercontinental ballistic missiles. And I said to myself, here we're killing this beautiful, intelligent, socially complex, self-aware sentient being for the purpose of making a weapon meant for the mass extermination of human beings. And it struck me, we're insane. And ecologically, we're certainly insane. And I said to myself that I would do everything I could to, you know, to protect their kind throughout, throughout my life. Thank you to Captain Paul Watson for being an incredible guest and for being so patient and gracious with all of our technical difficulties. Thank you also to Christian Mentz for editing this episode with all of its technical challenges. I think it was a challenging episode to edit, so thank you, Christian, for your work there. Thank you to Animals and Philosophy, Politics, Law and Ethics, Apple for sponsoring this podcast, to Jeremy John for the logo and Gordon Clark for the bed music. This is The Animal Turn with me, 
Claudia Hutzenfelder. For more great iRaw podcasts, visit iRawPod.com. That's I-R-O-A-R-P-O-D.com. Ah!